for now ladies and gentlemen boys and girls of all ages my dudes and my dudettes my odi and my yanks could you stand up on your feet rise up on your feet give it up for pastor moravi one jao come on come on come on give it up give it up give it up give it up Let's give it up for Jesus. Yeah. Woo. We bless you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Spirit lead me where my cross is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me. Take me deeper. Come on, I can't hear you. and my faith and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my spirit lead me spirit lead me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you will call me take me deeper in the presence of my savior we bless you jesus we love you lord we honor you jesus father god we declare that this is an altar of the most high god and right now there are angels that are coming up and down in this place because this is bethel the house of god And we declare that Lord Jesus you have control over this place. May your kingdom come. May your will be done here in Hill City in every campus that is streaming this in every individual home where this is being streamed right now. May it come as it is in heaven. We call down your power right now Lord. And Lord Jesus we declare that this is your place this is your throne. We we say that Lord any disrupting influences right now we take authority over them in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus. We declare that every destruction you bow down right now to Jesus Christ. Any agents that have come to disperse us we declare you're powerless right now in Jesus name. And I declare right now Lord that whatever situation your people are in whatever it is that would cause us not to hear your word Lord it is submitted every knee bowing down right now to the name of Jesus Father God we secure this airways for you we declare only your word will be heard in this place today And Father God I declare freedom over your people Hey who he who the son sets free is free indeed And I declare right now God's people you're free to hear your father's word. Every disruption right now it is bowing down in Jesus name. Every thought of anxiety right now that's not your thought. Just tell it get thee behind me. Get thee behind me right now. There is nothing that will keep me from understanding what my father brought me to hear in this house. And so Father God I thank you for every man, every woman, every person young or old, the children, the youth who are in this place. And we declare that Lord you will be glorified in our lives today. You will be glorified in our lives today. And we will apprehend the thing you have for us, Lord. Lord, we want to do only what you are doing. We want to hear only what you're saying. We want to see only what you want us to see. And so Lord, we declare that you are enthroned in this place. And we pray this in the mighty matchless name of our Lord and Savior, the one and only Jesus Christ. Everybody give a big shout to him right now. We love you Jesus. Ah, ah. Woo! Oh come on. Give your neighbor a high five. Tell him I'm so glad you're here. Oh my goodness. Woo woo woo. Amen. Please have your seats. Wow. It is so so good to see every one of you. I know there are people on the highway who are streaming this on their way here. Please drive safely. <laughs> If you're one of those, don't look at your just listen to the voice. Don't look at the screen. Uh, you know some people in Kenya you know how they drive have you seen guys driving like this my wife is laughing cuz she's seen me in traffic when i get impatient i get my phone and i start okay sorry i shouldn't say this on stage 
So, so drive safe. Uh, my goodness, I think that today is, today is a, a record sign up. I think we have over 550 people signed up to be here today. Isn't that amazing? Wow. And then I know there are many, many people signed up to watch online as well. We have watch parties from Kampala. I've seen the people from Kampala. I've seen Pastor Trevor. He's on uh, with his team in Malawi as well. I've seen pastors watching from different churches. So just a big shout out to all of you who are watching online. Let's just give them a big clap. We love you guys. And hey, everything that is happening in this house is for you as well. Because our Lord is not limited by geography. Amen. He's able to go wherever and everywhere. He's there in Jesus' name. And today is not a time of information. Uh, today is a time of impartation. Tell your neighbor, impartation. I believe the Holy Spirit is here and he wants us to catch a wind of what he is doing. And so I'm really looking forward to just, for all of us to just catch something. I love the question Pastor Angie led us in asking, what do you want? I really think God ministers in a special way when you know what you want. Am I speaking to somebody? You need to know what you want. Uh, what do you want when you're here? By the way, did you have something in your mind when Pastor Angie asked you to say, what do you want? What do you want? What is that thing that you want when you're here? Because when you want it, you come to Jesus, you know what to ask for. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What do you want? I want to see. <laughs> That's the, you need to know exactly what you want because he will give it to you. Amen. 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 So I'm going to just, uh, wow, just share some thoughts that God has been putting on my heart uh, as I've prayed about this day. One of the things I'm so excited is just to see the family gathered. Oh, wow, it's such a joy. Uh, this is a family. Just look around. These are your family. Uh, the people in this room, these are the, these, these are, this is the army in Mavuno Church, the family that is an army. When you're in a church, you always have a congregation. And the congregation has many different kinds of people. It has, it has a crowd. And Jesus always had a crowd around him. There were people who were there because they were looking for something. They were there because they had heard something was happening. They were there because their friends were there. There's always a crowd. But within the crowd, there was always a core. There was always an army. There were always the people who uh, with Jesus were with Jesus, not because of what he gave. They're the ones who told Jesus, whatever, wherever you go, we're there with you. We've given up everything to follow you. And so the people you're seeing are not just regular, regular Mavunites. This is an army. I don't think you guys are hearing what I'm saying. There's an army in this house. And that's one of the reasons why the gatherings are so powerful. I believe it's because the people who come into this place come with an expectation for something to happen. They come with a desire for Jesus. They're hungry for the Lord. By the way, you can't give up a whole Saturday of your life unless you're hungry for the Lord. Yeah, <laughs> Saturdays are important. After a stressful week, Saturdays are important, isn't it? You would not be here unless there's something that just drives you. You're like, Jesus, I want more of you. There's something I want in you. And so I believe that because we're here and we're gathered in his name, there's something powerful that God is going to unleash today. You know, my wife said something when we were, when we were fasting that really struck me. She said, when I pray during the seven-day fast, during the 21-day fast, I always feel like there's just a wind beneath my wings because it's not just my fasting that is helping me. There's a fasting of an army behind me. And she said, there's just something unique when God's people come with one mind. You know, uh, in, in Genesis chapter uh, 6, uh, when the people are building the tower to Babel, uh, and, and, and God says something powerful. He says, if as one people, speaking the same language, they begin to do one thing, nothing will be impossible for them. Tell your neighbor, one people. One language. One thing. And then say, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. I really believe that nothing is impossible today. So today we're going to see God just do some amazing things, and I, and I can't wait. I, you know, you can never out-hype God. You, you can never out-hype God. You, I can never tell you the greatest things God does until God is like, hey, hey come on. There are times when people introduce you and you're like, no, 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 no please don't talk too much. Uh, that's, you're going to give people too high an expectation. I can't deliver that. Anybody ever had that? It's like, no, no, that's not me. But God, you can never out-introduce God because there's nothing you can imagine. He says, no eye has seen. No ear has heard. No mind has imagined the things that God has in store for those who love him. God is not limited. And so I cannot out-hype God. God is in the house and God is going to be him. He's going to play like him. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. So, so I want to just jump right in uh, and just ask you a question. What is one thing you would definitely do if you had all the money you needed? 
Like money was not your object, your object. It's not even an issue for you. Like you have all the money you ever needed for the rest of your life. What is one thing you would definitely do? Come on, tell your neighbor. Just talk to your neighbor for a second. Uh, if you're in a watch party, talk to the person you're watching with. If you're not in a watch party, you're listening to this alone, make, maybe you can jot it down in a notebook or something or just think about it. What is one thing that you would definitely, definitely do? If you had all the money in the world, money was not your question, your problem, your issue. What's that one thing you'd be like, man, I'm going to build a rocket to Mars. <laughs> what, what is that thing you'd be like, man, I'm going to do this thing. What's that one thing? I want to, I'd love to hear. What, what's that one thing? The one thing you would do? Pastor Milton, I saw you laughing. What's the one thing Pastor Ndachi would do? He'd build a state-of-the-art stadium in every county. You want to be the government? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Godi, what did Pastor Angie say? Uh -huh, spiritual things. Uh -huh. <laughs> Check. Okay. So... The mummy of nations will uh, buy land and settle all her network churches. Ah, yeah, yeah, Can you imagine? Yeah, 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 oh, come yeah, on. Yeah. Very sp the moment of prayer. My gosh, I should have asked someone else. Huh? <laughs> you know now when you ask someone like that, now everybody will change theirs. All the Prada shoes you're going to buy now, you'll be like, no, 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 let me talk about how I'll plant churches and I'll make evangelism. And see, you <laughs> Pastor Angie, you've just messed this story. Oh, as you're in Hawaii. Okay, she'll be buying when she's... <laughs> okay. <laughs> she'll, be buy she'll be buying land for the churches as she's on... Will you be planting a church or you'll be on holiday with Nick? Or on holiday. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Now, at least people have relaxed. You would introduce pressure in the house. All right, somebody else. I'd love to hear somebody. One boy, what, what did Simon say? He wants to travel the world. Come on, somebody. And to build a retreat center for different families to come in. I love that. Okay. I love that. Uh, who else can I call? Uh, who else can I ask? Pastor, uh, Nick, what did, what, did, what did you say? What is the thing you do? Actually, tell me what Jade would say and then what you said. Uh, what did you say? What did Pastor? <laughs> Jade would buy a healing farm. A healing for, farm? Yeah. But personally, I would buy Manchester United. <laughs> hey, okay. So... Uh, there is ambition in the house. Tell your neighbor your dreams are valid. Your, your dreams are valid. We all have dreams, by the way. We all have things we'd like to do. We've all got things in our bucket list. Those things you're like, one day I would love to do this. If I have all the money in the world, money is not my object. There's this one thing, I just have to do it. And your dreams are valid. You know, the thing about it, for most of us, our dreams are really far away. It's like it's that big thing you'd love to do. But you know, you can't probably do it tomorrow. You can't do it next month or next year. It's probably something where things would really have to align. And you're going to have to put in a lot of hard, hard work and time uh, before you're able to get to that place where the dream is actually a reality. One day I'm going to do this. One day I'm going to go here. One day I'm going to build this. We all have those things that you're like, one day I'm going to do. Now, for many Christians, serving God falls in the category of this dream. One day, when I really have my act together, I'm really going to serve God. Man, right now, I know I'm, 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 I, I don't have enough money. Uh, I haven't sorted out my career yet. I, I haven't settled my business. Things are still, my business is still young. But you know, one day, you guys watch me. Just watch this space. Man, I'm really going to serve God. I mean, guys will not even believe how effective I'm going to be when things are sorted out. Am I talking to somebody in the house? And you know, by the way, let, let me just say, it's a valid thing to think, because after all, when you think about it practically, how, how can you serve God when you don't have your act together, when you don't have the basics, isn't it? I mean, you need, you need to make sure you have enough food to eat, kids, school fees has to be paid, uh, uh, you still have to make sure that you have uh, all these other things sorted, you have a place to live. I mean, those things are important. And so it's very easy to just say, hey, let me put those things in place. It, it just makes sense, it sounds practical. Let me put those things in place. And then when things are sorted, 
then I'll be able to do the things that will really honor God. I'll really be able to serve God. My goodness, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they are nothing on me. Like, watch this space. St. Paul, step aside. When I get my act together, my goodness, God is going to be honored in my life. Now, interestingly, we're not the first people in the Bible to think this. Uh, we're not the first generation to think this. The Bible has many stories of people who stood by this belief, who believed this thing. It's in a very short book, by the way. One of the shortest books of the Old Testament. One of the books of the Old Testament that I bet many people here have never read. And if I ask you to find it, it would take a few minutes for you to actually thumb through it in your Bible. It is the book of Haggai. I'm a Haggai. <laughs> that one. <laughs> So, so it's, it's that book. And, and many of you, if I ask you to, to tell me what the book of Haggai is about, you probably will be like, I, who is that? Like, where is that guy? I know he exists somewhere in the Bible, but I didn't even know there was a book called after him. Uh, it's that book that is usually very, not, not read much by Christians. But it has a very important perspective that many of us share, and we don't even know we share it with the people in Haggai's time. Because Haggai speaks to people like us who have dreams of serving God but many things that we feel we need to put in place before we can serve God properly. And so as you turn to the book of Haggai, uh, I'm going to give you a little context. I'm assuming you have your Bible. Uh, by the way, nowadays, anybody have a physical Bible in the house? Hey, shh, come on, they're still there. <laughs> Some of you are like, what's a physical Bible? It's okay. You got saved after <laughs> when you version was already the thing. So for you, it's digital. That's all right. Uh, just get it out. Uh, the book of Haggai. You can Google it, those of you who have the digital Bible. Uh, so, so the entire nation of Israel had been carried away into exile. I mean, they'd been taken, every man, woman, child, they'd just all been taken to another country. It's worse than colonialism, because in colonialism, somebody comes and takes over your country while you're still there. But in this case, the people came and took over their country and then kicked them out and pushed them to other places to go and serve other people. So it's like the worst kind of thing you can imagine. And for 70 years, they'd been kept in that captivity because of their rebellion against God. And then after 70 years, living as exiles, the Persian king, Cyrus, had allowed them to return back to their homeland. And so he had just somehow uh, touched by God because God had said in 70 years, the exile is over. So you can imagine these exiles, they, they go back home and it's a long distance to go back home. And they go back and they're led by a man called Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was actually a descendant of the kings of Israel. So he, was, he had royal family blood. Somehow he was still there. So he was entrusted with the people to go back home. And their big mission was we want to go and rebuild the temple of God. Because the temple of God had been destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar 70 years before. And so they go back home and they start. And they all are so psyched because it's like a dream come true. And for two years they build this temple. And they finish the foundation. When they finish the foundation, they have a big celebration. It's a big party. There's so much noise in the party. Everybody's blowing horns and, and celebrating. But their enemies hear about it. The nations around them are threatened that these people are reconstituting. And so their enemies start to do play politics against them, to threaten them, to intimidate them. And eventually they send a letter back to Persia saying that these guys are rebels. They shouldn't be allowed to continue. And so the work of the temple is put to a stop. And it's a very discouraging time. And these people are, are, are in that space where they, they wanted to do it, but things have happened, they can't do it. And 18 whole years go by. 18 years when there's nothing going on when it comes to God's work. A, a new king takes over in Persia. In fact, the Persian Empire is overthrown. The, the Medes come, the guy is called Darius the Mede. And things remain the same. But the Bible story is amazing. If you're a student of world history like I am, and then you study the Bible story, it's incredible just how it connects with the things that were going on uh, in, in world history. Because the Persian kingdom is thrown, it's, it's overthrown by the Medes, and the Medes uh, are part of the Persian kingdom, but they take over, and now they're the ones who are in charge, and, and King Darius is the guy who's uh, in charge there. Uh, remember the story of uh, 300. How many of you watched that crazy movie, 300? And there's a guy called Zaxus. Uh, who's that, that crazy guy with a six-pack in the movie? <laughs> they, they really add a lot of, they take a lot of liberty. Uh, this guy is, he's, he's probably around the time of Queen Esther. So he might have been Queen Esther's husband or uh, the father of Queen Esther's husband. There's, there's this whole thing just going on here where there's world history going on and then the history of God's people is in the middle of that world history. 
And so as, at, at that point, things are going on just the same in Jerusalem. Nothing is happening. And God raises a prophet called Haggai. And he sends Haggai to go back to Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest and to read a message from God to his people. And so that's what we're going to read as we read uh, chapter 1 of Haggai. Uh, Haggai chapter 1. And here's what it says. Read it along with me. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Tell your neighbor, give careful thought to your ways. And then he says, you've planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Let's read that part again together. Give careful thought to your ways. This is what he says. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine, the olive oil and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Wow. Lord, open your people's eyes. Help us to understand just how relevant this word is for us as God's people today. The people of Israel had failed, failed to rebuild God's temple. They had failed to do God's work. They felt it was not just the right timing. And Haggai says in verse 2, these people say, these people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Like God was hearing them. He was in their houses. He was in their conversations. It's like this is what they're saying when they talk. It's not the right time. This is not a convenient season. This is not a season that is possible for us to build God's house. Maybe it, it, it just felt like politically things were not on their side. Maybe it felt like, you know what, we've just come back to our land and we have to rebuild. Surely we've been in exile for 70 years. We have to look after our interests. Maybe they felt, my goodness, we need to start an education system. Our kids need to be in schools. Maybe some of them were like, my goodness, after that long journey, we need to rest. But for whatever reason, on the ground, things remained the same. Nothing moved when it came to God's word. And God asked them a very interesting question. He says, is it time for you yourselves to be living in paneled houses while my house is in ruins? In other words, they've not just built their house, now they're adding panels. They're doing finishes. They're working on the finishes of their house. And God's house is still a ruin. It's still an empty, forgotten foundation. Busy getting established. Busy sorting their careers. Busy building their businesses. Busy moving on in their affairs. Busy paying their children's school fees. And the phrase, that paneled house just says, busy adding on one thing to another. Adding beauty, adding, adding paneling, adding, adding finishes to your life. While the house of the Lord remains in ruins. Now, you know, I believe that the primary equivalence today of the house of the Lord, building God's temple, is this work that we've been talking about of discipleship, making disciples. That's the primary equivalent. Because, you know, in God's word, it says, uh, it says, in, um, it says in 1 Corinthians 3.9, 
No, yeah, 1 Corinthians 3.9. It says, for we are co-workers in God's service. This is Paul talking about himself and, and, and the guys he's, used, he's leading the church with. And then he says, you, to his disciples, you are God's field, God's building. God's building today is people. When you build up people, when you build up disciples, you're building God's house. That's, that's, that's the equivalent in these times. And God's primary call to us is to make disciples. The reason he left us on earth, the reason Jesus did not go up with his disciples, you know they could have gone up 12 of them. This thing was like a, it's, uh, you ever see these uh, science fiction movies? Like the guy just levitates. And they're watching. And you know they could have all had, and all of them just go up. You can see I've watched enough movies. They could have all gone up together. They could. Because they were all saved. There's nothing they had to do to get closer to God. They were already there. God had already told them, you're the pillars in my house. These are the ones who are going to be in heaven. They're, they're still going to be the pillars of the kingdom. So there's nothing they're going to do on earth that will make them more pillars than they already are pillars. They're already loved by God and accepted. Their work is done for them. The only reason they're left on earth is why? Because Jesus says to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples, turn other people into Jesus. Into, into, into people like me. Make them look like me. Baptize them. Teach them everything I've commanded you. This is why they're left on earth. This is the core business of every Christian. It's why you're here. This is the reason why you're here. And maybe you've said some things like the people in Haggai's time to yourself. As God's people, we say these things all the time. I'm not able to serve God right now because, man, I've got problems. You know, my finances aren't working yet. My, 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 married, my marriage is not in a good place. My, my health, you know my health problems. You know the issue I'm struggling with. I, I need to sort that out. I'm not able to serve God. My children, I've got issues. They, they have health issues right now. I'm not able to serve God. I'm not able to serve God because I'm too young. Any young people in the house? I'm so glad that we have young people in this house. Yeah, praise God. Yeah, don't, the Bible says don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Yeah. God can use 12-year-olds. God can use 15-year-olds. God can use 17-year-olds. He can use you where you are. And you can even do greater exploits than people who are twice your age, so long as your heart is ready for God to use you. Too many people say, I'm still too young. I'm not educated enough. I'm not able to serve God because my, my, my office work, you know the schedule that we have at work. Uh, I'm not able to serve God because my business is still young. I have to be there all the time. It won't allow me to go away. I'm not able to serve God because, uh, because of my kids. You know the season our life is in right now. You know how it is when you have four kids, three kids in the house. It's crazy. I can't really serve God right now. I'm not able to serve God uh, because I don't feel qualified. Any unqualified people in the house? Yeah, we're many of us. I just don't feel qualified. And that's, that's the thing that people were saying in Israel. It's just not the right time. It's not the right season for me to build God's house. And the thing about it is, the reasons sound really valid. They're logical. But God told them that there's a problem when you think like this. He says there's something that you don't understand that you're calling down on yourself. You know, when you feel it's more practical to focus on your interests when you feel it's more practical to focus on yourself at the expense of God's work, there's, a, there's, a, there's something that's going on spiritually that you're not aware of. You don't understand you're entering into an exercise in futility. And Jesus, and, and God tells them twice, you notice it was twice, huh? Give careful thought to your ways. Give care, it's like, listen, analyze. I want you to think about this. Like, don't jump into this, don't do what sounds logical right now. Give careful thought to your ways. Like, analyze and look at your results. See what you're getting from what you are doing. And ask yourself, is this the life I was created to live? Is this what honors God? Is this why God put me here on earth? You see, the, re the, the results you're getting in life right now are because of the choices you're making. The results you're getting in life are as a result of the choices that you're making. And if you're getting results that are not exactly what you should be getting, it's because of the choices that you are making. And God gives them five results that they were getting in their life that were not optimal results, not good results. He, he gives them very interesting, five things that are really relevant for us. I believe as I, as I look at this text, five things that are really relevant for us today. Five results when you fail to prioritize God's word. It's very interesting, by the way, this was not the word I planned to preach. 
But God just planted this thought in my mind and it couldn't let go of me. It just, just grabbed me. <laughs> and it's one of those few, few times when I, I, I don't even have an outline. I just sit down and I, it just came, it came all at once. And I was astounded by what Hagar had to say to us in our generation. And he says this, result number one, when you fail to prioritize God's work, your work becomes unfruitful. Your work becomes unfruitful. When you fail to prioritize God's work because you're doing your work, your work becomes unfruitful. And he says, you have planted much, but you have harvested little. Planted much, but harvested little. This is the, the principle of unfruitfulness. The curse of unfruitfulness that these guys were calling on themselves without even knowing what they were doing. You see, the picture here is of a, a, a hustler. <laughs> in Nairobi, in, in Kenya, we like to use that word. Is a person who do, puts in a lot of work to get ahead. They're working so hard. They're so faithful at their work. They want to get ahead at all costs. They're putting all their effort, all their, their time, all their energy into building their business, into lifting up their career, into finding that job, into doing the things that will take them ahead. But despite all the hard work that they're putting in, the results they're getting are not commensurate with the work that they're investing. Have you ever been there? Where you're working hard, you're pushing so hard, and when you look around, it just looks like you're treading water. Have you ever been in that place where you're... Anybody here ever tried to swim against the tide? I've swum against the current. There's a time, one day I almost died. I was, I was in camp. I think I was in college, early college or something. I can't remember. I think I was in college, uh, my early days. And we went to a camp, and we all got onto a tire. You know, those big, big, big tires they sometimes have in Mombasa. And there, were like, there must have been like 12 or many of us. And very foolishly, we're just so happily just kicking and swimming. And you know where this story goes. We, just, we, we forgot the time. We forgot where we were. And then at one point, we looked up. One person looked up and screamed. And when we looked, the hotel where we had entered the water looked like a matchbox. It was really, really far. And I remember at that point, we asked, who can swim? There was only one swimmer, <laughs> like a good swimmer. Everybody else was like, I can't swim at all, or like, I'm just one of those guys, like me. I was like, I'm, a, I'm okay, but I'm not a good swimmer. And so the good swimmer says, let me go he get help. <laughs> so the swimmer went and she was a good swimmer she was been born in Mombasa so she was a fish so I remember her name was Dana she, f she swam all the way we just saw her becoming smaller smaller until we couldn't see her anymore there was silence and then we noticed the hotel the matchbox was shrinking and I remember just uh, we were so panicked and uh, three, three Dana came back I mean she was a really good swimmer so after what seemed like an eternity she, she shows up with about five other people and they're all good swimmers, you can tell. And they're cutting through the water. And then they said, okay, we can't save all of you. Who, who can at least try? <laughs> so being, being, being myself, I was like, okay, me, I can try. Let me just, I'll, I'll take one for the team. Uh, so I, I said, okay, me, I can try. So they said, okay, go. So I jumped in the water. And it's like, whew, 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 whew. You know, you just swim, swim, swim. And then you look up. You guys, I don't understand how I made it out of that water. Because I wasn't a good swimmer. The, the longest I'd ever swam was maybe 20 minutes, like in a pool. Just, I'd never done like laps. I never went to, like I, I skived all the swimming training. And the, it's, a silly, it's a silly reason, because my, my younger brother learned how to swim before me, so I saw I don't care. You know how kids are? It's like, it's not interesting to me anymore. So, so when everybody was doing swimming training, me, I skived everything. I just wasn't interested. So it was actually Pastor Caro who taught me how to swim after we were dating. So it just tells you, I was at any, like, it, I swam for dating, for impressing girls, not for survival. <laughs> so I was putting in all my energy and working, like, for hours. My body is burning. And then I look up. The matchbox is slightly bigger, but it's still a matchbox. And guys, like honestly, I really believe an angel saved me that day. Because nobody came for me. I think it just felt like a long time later when I finally felt, I think at one point I felt I'm sinking. 
And then I felt the ground underneath me. And I was just like, I went, I just lay on the beach. Guys thought I was taking a nap. <laughs> Working so hard. But nothing is happening. And for some of us, that's our reality. It's like we put in so much effort, so much energy, so much hustle. Nobody could ever fault you for the kind of work you put into your, your career, your business. But there are no results. There are no results. Despite all those years working on your business, it's not making money. Despite all your education, you still can't get a job that is dignified. Despite <laughs> being called to so many interviews, you still never get those jobs. You apply more than anybody else you know. Despite having a beautiful farm, coming from a place with, a, with beautiful land, you, whatever you plant never seems to thrive or prosper. Just never seems to be enough. Despite your great ideas, you, you have ideas that you give to other people and they make money from. But they never work for you. Somehow it just doesn't work. Whatever you do never seems to bear fruit. It never seems to bear fruit. Yet you see people around you succeeding and they have a lot less than you, but they're achieving a lot more. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody in the house right now. Because God is saying, give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. These things could be symptoms of something deeper. King Solomon wrote in Proverbs 10, 22, one of my favorite verses, it says, the blessing of the Lord adds wealth <laughs> without painful toil, without sorrow attached. God's blessings don't have sorrow. They don't have, so they don't have toil. Yes, you work, but he blesses the work of your hands. That's how it's meant to be. And if you're in that place where the work of your hands is just not blessed, you need to understand that God's blessings are supposed to result in fruitfulness, in progression. Hard work is a good thing. Get, don't get me wrong, by the way, because some people think when I say God's blessings without sorrow, God doesn't bless laziness. He doesn't bless laziness. He will bless your hard work, but he will bless the work of your hands. And if you find that the work of your hand is not, you're, you're working so hard, but the work of your hand is giving you no results or little results, then that is unfruitfulness. And could it be, could it be that the results you're getting are because of the choices you're making? Could it be that that's what's happening? So that's the first thing that God tells the people of Israel. That, come on, come on guys, give careful thought to your ways. Number two, when you fail to prioritize God's work, you won't keep up with your needs. Second thing that happens to these people, they're not keeping up with their needs. Verse 6, the second part, he says, you eat, but you never have enough. By the way, all these things are in one verse, verse 6. <laughs> and so it's like each of these is just listed one after the other. You eat, but never have enough. And this is a principle of scarcity. Scarcity. They've called on themselves the curse of scarcity. The picture painted is of a person who is constantly consuming. But regardless how much they consume, they're never full. Some of you were like that as teenagers. Some of you still are like that. <laughs> like you can eat and eat and eat and it's just never enough. And it's because your metabolism is just so high, you're just burning it as it enters your stomach. Boom, it's just evaporating. Parents of teenagers are like, oh, that's what's happening. It's just the bread is just never enough. It just goes. But you know what? This is not supposed to be how life is. Like when your life is lived on that principle of scarcity, it's a dangerous place because it means that the need always outstrips the supply. You always have more need than you can supply. And you find that people like this, you have a job, but you're still broke. You buy food, but it never lasts till the end of the month. You always are scrambling to make ends meet. You bought a house, but somehow you can't keep up with the payments. You've got just, you, you, you finally got the spouse you prayed for, but now she's driving you crazy, he's driving you crazy. It's like, it's like the, you still are in need. Even though your, answers are, your, your prayers are answered, the need is always, it, it even feels bigger. You got your child, but that child now is wearing you out. It's like everything that is answered, just completely, you still find that you still have bigger needs every day because of the principle of scarcity. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. He says, and God is able to bless you, to generously provide for you your need, and then you will ha always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. The, the version I have says, God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, 
you will abound in every good work. That's how the blessing of the Lord works, guys. The blessing of the Lord, it, it feels that you can do more. Having all that you need, he's not a God of scarcity. Tell your neighbor, God is not a God of scarcity. He's not a God of scarcity. And I believe he's saying to somebody in the house, just like he did to the Israelites, give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. These things could be as a result of something else. Could it be that the results you're getting are because of the choices you're making? There are choices you're making that could be resulting in what you're seeing. And that's the second thing he tells the people of Israel. The principle of scarcity. The third thing he says, when you fail to prioritize God's work, you will never be satisfied. You will never be satisfied. The, sec- the third part of verse 6 says, you drink but never have your fill. This is a principle of unfulfillment. Unfulfillment. They're never fulfilled. So here you imagine, not a person who has scarcity. It's actually a person who has everything they need, but their thirst is still not quenched. Like, they have it. It's not like it's running out. It's there. But it doesn't satisfy them. It's a crazy place to be. It's a, I, I, I can't find satisfaction. It doesn't matter how much I earn. It doesn't matter how big a promotion I have. It doesn't matter. It's like I just am not satisfied. And the richer I get, the more dissatisfied I feel. I never feel like like, like I'm where I'm supposed to be. And the more I earn, the more miserable I become. And I don't know if you know people like that, by the way. I know people like that. It's like they're always going for the next thing because even the things they have just don't satisfy them. You get the job of your dreams. But you hate going to work. I mean, you prayed for this job for so long. We prayed for you. We laid hands on you. But even there, when you are, the minute you land there, it's just you just don't feel satisfied. Nothing satisfies you. You, you moved into that neighborhood you always wanted. But you don't, you don't enjoy being there. It's just not satisfying. Or maybe you don't even have time. You're never in that house anyway. You, 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 you can eat all the food you want. But you're too busy to enjoy it. You, the things you have, are just they never seem enough. I remember one time I was telling my wife um, a while back, I took a trip with people from this church and we went to uh, Orange County. And uh, a friend of ours gave us a ride on his boat. It was a nice boat. Uh, it was a boat like, like <laughs> see, he, he, you know, you guys are thinking boat. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, it was a, a boat. Like it had eight, it, it was an eight bed boat like there were eight eight people could sleep and go on a cruise on this boat it was and and the beds were made i mean really it's got all the plumbing the showers for all those eight people a kitchen uh, a deck so i mean like it's 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 like it was a nice it was the nicest boat i'd ever been in and this guy was taking us around uh, balboa island and he's he's driving he's pointing out things and then another boat passed us I mean, this boat was like three times bigger than what we are in. And I'll never forget, I mean, we talked about it and debriefed it later because we couldn't understand. Because the guy just said, oh my God, look at that boat. (laughs) And you know, for us from Africa, we look at him like, dude, (laughs) like nobody in our continent has a boat like this. Like, oh my God, look at that boat. And the guy who owned the boat was a billionaire. He's one of the guys on the Forbes list. Um, And it's like that thing of, he has... Such like a boat that could fit us and our relatives. In fact, those eight beds are for eight Americans. You know, it's like me and my clan can fit in that boat, you know? And the guy is looking out and saying, oh my God, look at that boat. It's like what you have just doesn't satisfy you. You never have enough. And some of you are there right now. You, 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 you are the envy of the people in your compass. Everybody thinks, I wonder what it will be like to be, to be that person. But for you, you never feel like it's enough. You never feel satisfied, even though you have everything you could ever need. You can go anywhere you want to, but you're just not in a joyful space. You have a beautiful family, the envy of everybody around you, but even that family doesn't satisfy you. You're hardly home with them because it's just not satisfying. Psalm 107, Psalm 107, verse 9, it says, For he, Jehovah, satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. This is the God we serve. He satisfies. God's blessings, they satisfy. 
the restless longing for more all the time, never being satisfied, that is not the God of heaven. That's a different God. So Isaiah 58 verse 11. It says, the Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you're dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, an ever-flowing spring. That's how God's blessings are. He blesses you so that it overflows. Like he told the Samaritan woman, when I give you the water I have, not only will it quench your thirst, it will actually overflow and become a blessing to others. That's the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich. God is a God of satisfaction and not a God of frustration. And so he's saying to someone in this house, give careful thought to your ways. Because could it be that that frustration you're feeling, the results you're getting, are because of the choices that you're making? And God is saying, give careful thought to your ways. Number four, the fourth thing he talks to them about. Are we together? Are we, are we, it's number four I'm on, right? Yeah. So he says, when you fail to prioritize God's work, you will lose your protection. Somebody say protection. You lose your protection. This is the fourth part of verse six. He says, you put on clothes, but you're not warm. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. This has to do with vulnerability. This is a principle of vulnerability. Like, like the picture you get is a person who is full, has a wardrobe full of clothes, but regardless of how many layers they put on, they, they can't feel warm. <laughs> they can't keep warm. We would say in this part of the world, the cold is in their bones. Have you ever had cold in your bones? Have you ever gone to, to bed and then your feet are cold and it doesn't matter how many covers are on, any, any cold feet are in the house. It doesn't matter how many covers there are and it's like you're freezing. And those of you who are married, when you come and put your feet next to your spouse, like, ah! I might bring you some relief to a marriage right now, just to know you're not alone. <laughs> cold fetus in the house. It's like the cold is in your bones. It's not, the cover, it's not the quality of the covers on your feet. The cold is inside. It needs more than just a cover to get it out. And you know, they talk about old people. Many times old people get here. You get to a place where, when you, as you age, uh, as you get into your 70s, your 80s, where things begin to happen and you can't stay warm for many reasons. Several reasons, uh, 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 physiologists tell us, number one, your metabolic rate decreases, such so your body is not producing enough heat in the first place. For all people, your, met your metabolic rate is much slower. And then number two, your circulation slows down. So your blood is not able to, to produce, uh, even the heat that's being produced is not being taken around fast enough to your extremities. Number three, you have less fat. As you grow older, you find there's less fat uh, and your, th your skin is, is thinner. And so basically what happens as a result of not having these things, you, what normally protects a person has come out of you and you're vulnerable. You're in a place of vulnerability. And old people many times become vulnerable to things like pneumonia, to arthritis, to hypothermia, to asthma. They can be freezing in a place where it's warm for everybody else. Some of you have seen this happening because you're old enough that your parents could be in that space. I mean, my mom, many times, will put on a, a, a fire in the, in the middle of the day. She has a fireplace, and you might find a fireplace in the house because she's cold, and everybody else is not. That's what happens. Now, unfortunately for some of us, it happens in life. It's not, a, it's not phys physically. It's something that just happens in our lives, that we find ourselves vulnerable. You buy things, but they always get broken. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. You buy clothes, but they always seem to wear out in a much shorter time than they should. You start a business, and you put in all the time, but your employees steal you blind. Like anybody who works for you just steals from you. You're prone to frequent illnesses and accidents, and, and, and those illnesses are those illogical illnesses. The doctor has even become your friend. The nurse knows you by first name because you're always there. You're always calling. You're always sick. Your children are always at the doctors. The inheritance is yours. It was given. Even the will said it. But you will never possess it because everybody is standing against it and everybody is taking advantage of what's yours. You make money, but others are the ones who seem to enjoy it. People always seem to take advantage of you. I don't know if I'm speaking to somebody in the house right now. You're, 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 you're vulnerable. You always find yourself in a vulnerable place. And that's what it means to go without protection. Without protection. Psalm 34 verse 19. Uh, this is the words of the Lord. Psalm 34 19. 
It says, the righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. The Lord always delivers. This is what the Lord we serve. Psalm 34 verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. This is, this is the version I have. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. That's NIV. He delivers them. God is more than able to protect us. Jesus never said that we won't have trouble. Trouble comes. But when trouble comes, he is there. His rod and staff, they comfort us in the middle of the valley of the shadow. That's what it means when you're following Jesus. Now, don't, I, want, I want to make sure that I'm not, somebody doesn't get me wrong with this. Maybe the troubles you're facing are for a different reason. Sometimes God allows us to go through the valley of the shadow, not because he doesn't love us, but because he wants us to know him in a different way. You've known him as provider. Jehovah Jireh has been your provider, provider, provider. But God wants you to know him as your comforter. And you will never know the comforter unless you need comfort. And so right now, some of you may be going into a season that it's just the Lord has allowed it. And at that point, what the Lord says is, hang on, persevere. Blessed is the one who holds on till the end. I will bless you for just being faithful. And that's a beautiful thing when the Lord says that to you. But not all our troubles are because of righteous persecution. Not all our troubles are because God has allowed us to go through that season. God is saying, give careful thought to your ways. Meditate. Reflect on the trouble season you're going through. Reflect on your vulnerability. You want to make sure that these things are not self-inflicted. You want to make sure that it's not because of the way I'm living that I'm ex experiencing these attacks. Because the results you're getting could be because of the choices you're making. Tell your neighbor, give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to your ways. And then there's a fifth one that God says. By the way, I'm sure as these guys were listening, their minds were just processing, my goodness. I mean, because God is like, think, think, think. I want someone to think in the house today. Verse five, uh, the fifth one, when you fail to prioritize God's work, you will lose even what you get. You will lose even what you get. Verse 6, the last part says, you earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is a, the, the principle of perpetual loss perpetual loss. A wallet, you have a, you have a wallet, you put money, but it, when you open that wallet, there's no money. You knew it had money. <laughs> but it's just like, it just seems to disappear. There's perpetual loss. And I suspect there, there are many people in this audience who have actually encountered this principle. Have you ever made money to feel like your, holes have, your pockets have holes in them? I was going to say your holes have pockets in them. <laughs> Sometimes it can be that bad. They're devourers in your house, and they're devouring everything you make. You're always misplacing and losing things. You just can't seem to keep them. Stuff gets stolen from you all the time. You get great opportunities, even promotions, but somehow it just seems to, you, you get demoted even after you get it or you lose your job. You start a business at the time the industry is going down, and somehow it just always seems like whatever you put your energy into just seems to go down. It's like, Yes, the opportunities are coming, but somehow they just seem to pass through your fingers and they never stick in your house. Your story is one of loss, losing money, losing opportunities, losing relationships, losing customers, losing, losing, losing. And you just find this is your reality. This is your reality. You know, those people who plan to give to God one day when everything is working, they will never have enough for themselves. That's what this scripture is telling us. You know, this is similar to the curses that God promised the Israelites. Uh, my wife used to be, be uh, passionate about Deuteronomy. And I know she, I don't know if she still prays that, but she used to, any time she was praying for people, this was the place I'd find her prayers coming from. And she talked about the curses and the blessing. And Deuteronomy chapter 28 talks about the curses and the blessings. And, and, and there's some beautiful blessings in that passage. But there are also some scary curses. And God says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, starting from around verse 30, if you could just put up the verse 30 up there, uh, Deuteronomy 28, 30. Uh, this is Moses writing to the Israelites. I don't know if you have, uh, I'm going to read 28, 30 to 31, um, as, as they are finding it. It says, you'll be pledged to be married to a woman, but another will take her place and rape her. You will build a house, but you will not live in it. 
You will plant a vineyard, but you will not even begin to enjoy its fruit. Your ox will be slaughtered before your eyes, but you will eat none of it. Guys slaughter your cow, and then they roast it, and then they eat it. <laughs> your donkey will be forcibly taken from you and will not be returned. Your sheep will be given to your enemies, and no one will rescue them. Oh my gosh. I mean, those are bad things, isn't it? Now, 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 again, I just want to be careful. I don't want anybody to miss what I'm saying. I'm not saying misfortune is a sign that God is not with you. I don't want anyone to miss that. That's not what I'm saying. There are many times that misfortunes come despite our faithfulness to God. And in those times, blessed are you when you're persecuted on account of me. That's what Jesus says to you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. In fact, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Jesus says that. But many times, Christians are persevering things they have no business persevering. They have normalized things that they have no business normalizing. They have embraced a lifestyle of curse and seen it as normal. Maybe even spiritualized it. It's like a song we used to sing. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay, my dear, it's okay. In the land of paradise, where there is no surprise, no worries, no sorrow, no sh... Jesus. It's okay. It's okay. I'm just suffering for the gospel. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're embracing things you have no business embracing. And God is saying, give careful thought to your ways. Tell your neighbor, give careful thought to your ways. These results you're getting could be because of the choices you're making. And if you're experiencing unfruitfulness, scarcity, unfulfillment, vulnerability, perpetual loss, these are not things that you should be experiencing. You need to be asking God, God, show me why this is my reality. Show me why these are the things that I'm experiencing. Because you know, if you want to experience different results, you have to make different choices. You have to make different choices. Fortunately for us in the book of Haggai, if it was left like that, I think it would be a very depressing book, isn't it? Be like, oh my gosh, that is so depressing. But I thank God because God did not leave the Israelites without an answer. He didn't just rebuke them. He told them, this is the wrong thing. Let me show you the right way. And God tells them very interesting things. He continues to tell them in verse 8 of, of, of Haggai chapter 1. He says, Here's what you need to do. Go up into the mountain, bring down timber, and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. My goodness, three things he's saying, and I want us to focus on those things. He said, go up. Someone say, go up. Go up. Number two, bring down. bring down. Number three, build. build. These are the three things that God says that every Israelite at that time needed to engage themselves in. Go up. Bring down, build. Let's go through them each one by one. Number one, go up, speaks of surrender. Go up, speaks of surrender. These people were to climb up to the mountains. They were to leave the comfort of their homes. They were to go up into the uncomfortable places. The places where they could find wood to build God's temple. Going up was not an easy thing because it connoted stopping their business. Are holding off on the things that were important to them. It connoted sacrificial living as they went up into those places. They had to cut wood. They had to live maybe up in, 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 in tents as they're up in those mountains. You know, there's never a convenient time to serve God. And there's never a way that God calls you to, call, to serve him that is convenient for you. It's just, the thing, it's, it's just the thing that maybe we've taught in church, in modern church, that is so wrong. Because Jesus never taught people, follow me and your life will be so easy. By the way, it's not in the Bible. He never ever said that. He says, follow me and I'll make you. And it sounds good. Fishers of men. Yeah, I will make you fishers of men. It sounds so nice. <laughs> but he says, if anyone is not willing to hate father and mother, to hate those who are close to them, and to follow me, they can't be my disciple. Jesus calls them. In fact, I like to say, Jesus calls them to come and see. And when they see, he calls them to come and follow. And when they follow, he calls them to come and die. That's Jesus. Because he knows it's only when you die that you will live. That's why we say, I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, 
but Christ lives in me. And he says, the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Some of you forgot it after Mizizi immediately. Galatians 2.20. This is why we say this. The business of surrender. And Jesus says to his disciples, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. That's surrender. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Oh my goodness, we always think of tiny baby Jesus, so sweet, so kind, so nice. to. No, no, Jesus wasn't baby Jesus, so sweet. He's a bit harsh when you think about it. Some of these, these are things you're saying to your friends. It's like, dude, choose. Either you're with me or you're not with me. You remove your hand from this plow, you're not fit to be my disciple. That's Jesus speaking. Luke chapter 14, verse 33. He says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Wow. This stuff is serious stuff, isn't it? This is not the stuff that grows you followers on, on Instagram. Uh, this is the stuff that makes people leave. People don't stay around. Mat Matthew chapter 10, verse 38. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. That's Jesus. Those are the words he says. Tell someone there's a cost. There's a cost. You know, I was a Christian for six whole years before someone taught me that there was a cost. I thought Christianity was insurance, fire insurance. I knew there was a fire coming one day. And I knew the way to buy a, uh, what you do is just buy a policy. And when the fire comes, you'll not burn. And all you have to do is say the prayer after me. Anybody ready to say the prayer after me? Dear Jesus, I come to you today. I give you my life. From today, I am saved. Come into my life. Forgive my sins. And right now, I give my life to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Boom! Fire insured. No fire can touch me because I'm heaven bound. And I can live how I want until Jesus comes and takes me to heaven. That's how I thought. That's the gospel I believed. Six years into it, somebody taught me you cannot be his disciple unless you're willing to die to everything you have and surrender to him. And to be able to say, just like Jesus said to his father, not my will, but yours be done. This is a basic prayer, by the way, of the Christian life. If you're a real Christian, if you're a real follower of Jesus, that's your prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. That's your daily prayer. You die to Christ daily. Following Jesus is about surrender. It's about moving from living to myself for, to living for the one who gave his life for me. And that's why we talked about uh, being crucified with Christ. You know, the first thing that God tells these people is go up. Go up. Guys, you're down here. Go up. Tell your neighbor, go up. Yeah, there's a cost. There's a cost to this thing. Jesus is, God is saying to them, guys, you've been doing this wrong. The results you're facing because of the choices you're making, give careful to your thought to your way. And then he says, go up. Go up. So the first thing is surrender. Number two, bring down. Somebody say bring down. Bring down speaks of resources. Resources. These people were to bring the timber that they had produced from felling and processing the trees in the forest. So they put in their labor. And the results of their labor they were now supposed to bring to God's house. They were to invest these things into building God's house. Serving God will always demand that we give up resources. It will always demand resources of us. Read the Bible. There is no worship Anywhere in the Bible without a sacrifice. You know, we don't, even this took me a while to realize. That there is no place where people worship and there's no sacrifice. I used to sing that song. We bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And I thought, my voice is the sacrifice. I hadn't read the Bible. Because in the Bible, people sacrifice. When you see those goats dying, there are people's resources. God didn't provide a lamb. The only place God provided provide a lamb was for Abraham. Every other lamb cost somebody something. It was their economy. People saved through. You didn't have cash. You had cows. They were like Maasai's and our nomadic tribes. So when somebody gave and was killed, it wasn't coming back to them. It was given. It was resource that was brought to build God's house. Worship always costs us. And a follower of Jesus knows that everything they own belongs to God. And that all they are is a steward and a caretaker. You know, that perspective changes everything. When you think you're the owner and you think you're giving to God, 
it's a very different perspective because then you're trying to think, how much can I give to God so he gets out of my way? Anybody ever been there? Like, how much do I, how much can I, like, what's the least I can give to God so that I'm right with him? That's a person who thinks they own it. But the person who knows it's God's says, how much do I need to live on? Because the rest belongs to God. How much, how much has God given me to live on? How much can I get away with living on so I can serve the one who gave it to me? Very different perspective. And God is saying, bring resource towards building my house. Your time. You know, we always say things like, my, 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 my car, my house. And I say this myself. I catch myself very guiltily saying this. My house, my car, my job, my money, my family, my time, my reputation. But what I really call my belongs to God. And what I need to be saying is God's house, God's job, God's money, God's family, God's time, God's reputation. All these things are God's and God expects me to invest them into building his house. That's the way it is. By the way, I, sound, I feel like the amens have gone kind of strangely dim. This message started with a lot of amens, but it's getting quieter and quieter. I don't know what's happening in the house. How is your car a resource for building God's kingdom? Since the time God gave you that car, if he was to come and audit your use of that car, would he say, wow, my car has been used for my business? Or would he say there's been misappropriation in this house? How is your house a tool for God's kingdom? How is your career a tool for God's kingdom? You know, many, many of us pray, Pastor, pray for me. I, 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 there's this interview I'm going for, pray for me. And the person comes and says, praise God, I got a job. The next thing you know, they're not even in discipleship group anymore. They're too busy with that job. The very blessing of God has kept you from the work of God. And it's like, how, 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 how is this thing helping you to serve God? How is that business a kingdom business? If God was to audit your business, what kingdom results would he see because he trusted you with it? That's the thing we need to be asking ourselves. That degree he's allowed you to study for, that school he's placed you in, that you didn't earn for, to put yourself in there, God allowed you to be there. If God was to come and say, how have you used the opportunity I've given you to spread my kingdom? What would you say? I think God is going to hold us accountable. And God is saying, bring it down. Tell your neighbor, bring it down. Bring it down. Yeah. Bring it down for God's use. Invest it in God's kingdom. Allow God to use it. You know, there's a time when David wanted to build a temple, uh, wanted, wanted to build an altar to God. And as he went to build that altar, uh, um, he, he, there was a play going on in the land and David wanted to build this altar and, and, and he went to a man called Arauna, you know the story, and the guy tells him, king, my, like it's the king asking me for land, have it, have it for free. It's like it's yours. But David said something very powerful to him. First Chronicles 21 verse 22. David said to him, let me have the sight of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at the full price. Arauna said to David, take it. Let my Lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give you an oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and wheat for the grain offering. I will give you all this. The guy is like, don't even worry, king. It's all sorted. You're the king. I want to honor you. I want to honor God. It's all yours. David says something very powerful. King David replied to Arauna, no, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take from the Lord what is, for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. David knew there's no worship without sacrifice. There's no way I can come to God's house without investing in God's work. And he, he's like, dude, I love the fact that you love God like that, but this one is on me. I'm, I'm, doing this, I, I, I'm the king. I'm carrying this one personally. Now, the interesting thing is David paid around 600 shekels of gold for the site. He built an altar to the Lord there, sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He called on the Lord and the Lord answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of burnt offering. You know, Arauna understood honor, but David did not want to give the Lord anything, something that did not cost him. And he paid full price. Later on, by the way, by the way, I've been to that place. I've been to that place where the altar was built. Uh, I've actually walked on those stones. And the reason I can tell you that is because later on, that is the site where King David's son built the temple. That's where the temple currently stands today. It's a land that David bought with his own money. And the crazy thing about it 
is when David came to God and said, I want to build your temple, God told him, your hands are too bloody. Uh, you've been a man of war. I, I need a man of peace to build this house. And so he said, let your son build it. So David, 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 if he was like me, he'd have been like, oh my gosh, cool. I mean, I had a good heart. God saw I wanted to do it. He's told me someone else does it. Cool beans, man. God bless me. <laughs> you know, I, I've done my part, isn't it? Most of us would be like, I did my part. I had the right intention. <laughs> I offered. <laughs> huh? Seriously. But you know what? First Chronicles 22, verse 5, David's response. David said, My son Solomon is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of the nations. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. And it says, David made extensive preparations before his death. Like, he's like, you know what? Let him build. But you know what? I'm going to prepare for it. I'll pay for it. And then in verse 14, he's addressing his son Solomon, 1 Chronicles 22. He says, I've taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord 100,000 talents of gold. That's about 3,750 tons. A million talents of silver. Quantities of bronze and iron too great to be weighed. And wood and stone. And you may add to them. <laughs> like, like, like if, you, if you want, feel free to add. However, you don't need to. Because I've got this. And then he says in verse 15, You have many workers, stone cutters, masons, carpenters, as well as those skilled in every kind of work. In gold, silver, bronze, and iron, craftsmen beyond number. Now begin the work and may the Lord be with you. He's like, okay, God, you're saying I can't build? Sour. I'm not missing this blessing. My son, I don't know about him, but me, I am giving. Can you imagine that? He's competing to give to God's work. He's like, I don't want anyone to stand in the way of my blessing. It's like, it's like, it's like the pastor says, we need, to, we need to raise some money to buy some screens in, in Mashariki Church. And then two people come and say, we've bought the screen. And, 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 and pastor comes and people celebrate, yay! And most of us are like, hey, thank God, someone has done it. Me, by the way, if they had only waited, I'd have brought my... <laughs> but there's a pastor in that church who says, no! How did they get there before me? And he's like, I'm not missing the blessing. And he calls Pastor Milton by night and says, I don't care if you wanted two screens. Here's another one for the children. Because I'm not missing the blessing. I'm bringing it down. I'm bringing it down. God's people, you need to understand that blessings are brought down. Blessings are brought down. And God is telling these people, go bring it down. Bring it to my house. That this house will be built up. You may not be rich. You may not be a rich king yet. Yeah. It may not have come yet. But right now, how are your resources being used to build up God's house? Yeah, Because some of us are waiting till we're like David. I have 3,750 tons of gold to give towards. Some of you are like, one day, Maze, Pastor Milton will be saying we're planting a church. I say, Pewa. There is the land. One day, in Jesus' name, it will come. But let me tell you, right now you can buy a microphone. Yeah, you may not have the money for the land. But right now, are you faithful with a little? Because the one who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. And so God is saying, bring it down. Does your expenditure display whose resources you're managing? If somebody was to just audit you and to look at your expenditure for the last month, would they tell whose servant you are? That's not a rhetorical question. It's like, a, like consider, like think, would they? Or would they say, no, this one lives for themselves? Because God is saying, bring down. Tell your neighbor, bring down. The third thing that God commands them is, Build. Build. And, and, and build has to do with engagement. It has to do with engagement. Now, God didn't say, bring down those resources and give them to qualified contractors and, and, and masons and other people who can build my house. He didn't say that. Did you notice that? He says, bring down those resources that you may build my house. It's like God expected every Israelite, man, woman, child, old, Every one of them married, single. God expected everybody to play their part in building God's house. Everybody was supposed to build God's house. Everybody was expected to become a kingdom builder. It's interesting that for me, there's a place where I feel there's so much, there's, there's some people who get this. 
Like they just throw themselves into serving God. They want to be on the forefront. They don't want to miss the blessing. I love that. Uh, today I'm going to, I, I, you know, I've been spending some time with Pastor Milton. I've uh, had a chance to visit Mashariki, so I'm picking on you a bit. Uh, but I remember just when I came to Mashariki the last time that I spoke about three families. Are they three or four? Three, three families. And these are three families that, as they prayed in the church, they just felt our pastor is going through a, t- a, a tough time right now. Uh, he's trying to settle the church. We're sort of coming out of COVID. Things are not working well. He has some health problems in his family. There are things just, and they just decided, you know what? This can't happen while we're here. And those three families, but they, let me just honor them. Are you guys here? Just stand up if you're here, those three families. I just, if they're here, I just want to, if you're here, I can see this, they're, they're all sitting on that side. I honor you guys. I've honored you in Mashariki. I want to honor you in the movement and in front of all your peers. And I want to say this not to, you know what? I don't believe honor is, I think honor is a good thing. And I I think you are worthy of honor because of your heart for God's house. And they came to Pastor Milton and they told him, "Uh, Pastor Milton, we're here. We're your armor bearers. You cannot go down while we're here. And they said to him, (laughs) <laughs> we're going to cook for you. Like, there will be a meal in your house. Every, every weekend when you come, because we know the challenges you're facing, every weekend when you come to church, you will carry food for the week. They said, we want to come and spend the night at your place so that we can pray for you and just sort out your house. They said to him, uh, we want to pray for you, and so we're going to take time to fast for you every week. And we'll take turns. Individuals will cover different days so that there's somebody fasting for you every day of the week. Recently, Pastor Milton uh, got, got uh, Pasi, sorry, I hadn't warned you about this. I should have warned you, I know. Pastor Milton got, um, uh, what, what really was an eviction notice, isn't it? I mean, the guy just bumped up his rent unnecessarily. So Pastor Milton needed to move back to Eastlands. He has a house there that he used to live in. It was his bachelor pad. And then he had moved away. And he had made all the plans to move. And this group and others in the church came alongside him. And they said, Pasi, you can't live in that house. Uh, stop the move, take an extra month. And they came, and they've invested in that house. They have added value to it. I mean, when Pastor Milton showed me the pictures of what they had given him, they got an architect to come and actually replan the house so that he can take a wife there. They said, this was your bachelor house, Pastor. You can't take Pastor Vivian there. And they said, we're taking, we're doing this with you. And they told him, stay, you preach the word. We're going to make sure by the time you move into this house, it's a house worthy of our pastor. And right now, Pastor Milton is going to move. <laughs> when are you moving? He's waiting for, he was waiting for the gathering. This coming week, he moves into his newly refurbished house. Wow. Somebody give glory to God. Woo! And I want to say, there are kingdom builders among us. There are kingdom builders among us. I just want to honor that group and others at Mashariki who've said we're standing with our pastor. We're, we're coming. And by the way, it's not just the pastor they serve. They say we, they serve the church because these are the same guys you're going to see serving at Mashariki, standing up to serve in every point. And I want to bless God. I think I, I, I know there are other places, many of, of you others who are doing other crazy things like that, but I wanted to just honor this particular group because I know that story and I'm so blessed by it. Pastor Milton, you have an army. You have powerful men and women around you. These are like the mighty men and women of David. They're building God's house. Come on, let's appreciate them one more time. Amen. Ask your neighbor, are you a kingdom builder? Turn and ask your other neighbor, are you building God's house? This is why you are created. You are created to build God's house. That's why God placed you in Mavuno family, to build God's house. That's why God has put you in that school he's placed you in. That's why God has put you in that employment place. That's why God has put you in that business he's given you. He's allowed you to live in that estate so that you can build God's house. You can do the work of God. So that you can disciple ordinary people. You can make it possible for the church of God to disciple ordinary people and turn them into fearless influencers of society. That is why you're here. Your mansion in heaven is already there. You're not, you're, not, you're not trying to... There's nothing you can do that will ever make God love you more. 
you could die today and you will still be next to Jesus. Am I, am I speaking to somebody in the house? You will still have your heavenly room. You're, you're not here to, to prove anything to anybody. You're not serving so that you can earn it. You're serving because you've got it. You're serving out of love because already you've been loved. All the love has been given to you. And Jesus has left you here for a little part of your existence. Your life is like this. In the existence of eternity that you will live. And this little part is for you to build God's house. Build God's house. Build God's house. That's all you're here for. Everything else is something to help you to do this one thing. And so people should be able to look at your life and say, this is a kingdom builder. This person is aligned to why they're here. They understand why they've given careful thought to their ways. And they know why God put them on earth. Build God's house. Now, is God against you having a good lifestyle? Is God against you having a nice house? Is God against you having a nice car? No, he's not. That's not what I'm saying. But God wants you to understand the issue of priority. Tell your neighbor, priority. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But seek first. That's your first priority. And it says all other things, they'll be added. They will follow. Stop chasing things. Let things chase you as you chase God, as you chase his kingdom, as you follow him. Ah, I want to conclude. I want to conclude. Jesus had many people who followed him. But there are also people who gave him stories. Matthew chapter 8, verse 21 to 22. Another disciple said to him, disciple, by the way, another disciple, the disciple, you'll never know their name. Why will you never know their name? Because this disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. He's like, Lord, I want to follow you. But, but, but there are inheritance issues to be sorted out. There's, there's, there's family, important fa I say, these things are logical, by the way. It's very logical. I need to sort out things and when things are sorted, Jesus said to him something that is really cryptic. You, the God of love says this, let the dead bury their dead. In other words, he's like, there's a time for everything. But you seek first. You seek first. That's what I want of you. Luke now, chapter 9, verse 61 to 62. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go and say goodbye to my family. It's like you'd expect the God of the universe, the God who loves family to say, Oh, <laughs> so sweet. You want to follow me, but you want, Oh, <laughs> run along and say, Jesus says, <laughs> what does he say? Oh my gosh. I wouldn't even say that one. Jesus, Jesus is just not patient with such stories. He's just not patient. There's no place for emotional distractions or double-minded commitment. There's no place for that in following Jesus. Jesus, the God of grace. We follow him with our whole heart. Tell your neighbor, be a kingdom builder. Be a kingdom giver. What excuses have you been giving for why you can't radically follow Jesus and do his work? What are you so busy pursuing that you've put before following God? I challenge you to put the word of God into practice and start serving God from today. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I want to pray for us. And as I pray, I just want to pray because I know that some of us who are so convicted by this, you know what the Lord is speaking to you about. There are things that God has spoken to you about in this church and maybe you've just distract, you've been distracted. There are things that have kept you from being 100% in. You've been 90% in, 80% in. There's just been this one part of my life that, you know what, this, if only this was sorted, I would follow God fully. And God is saying, follow me even with that issue. Even that mess that you're trying to sort out, it's part of your platform. It's part of what I'm going to use to glorify myself in it. So I want you to submit that issue and start following me 100% with that issue. And some of you, God is already speaking to you about that. Some of you, by the way, it's basic things. It's things like tithe. You have struggled to tithe. You've just never, never, you always find yourself negotiating or thinking about it. For some of you, it's free the future. Uh, God, God has said this word to the church. It's, it's his clear word. And he says, trust me in this. <laughs> He says, trust me, there's no eye has seen. You want the blessing, but you don't want the sacrifice. And God is saying, I want you to take a step and just believe me. And take a step of faith and just do it. Trust me to look after you.
For some of us, it's being in a, some of us, even joining a discipleship group has been tricky. Because it's like my job, my busyness, I'm always tired. And God is saying, who gave you your body? Who gave you even the strength and that job that you have? I want you to follow me. I want you to be a disciple and make disciples. You can't be join a discipleship group so that you can be taught how to disciple and you can have your own disciples. And God is saying, hey, listen, I want you to build my house. I want you to build my house. And so I want to just pray for us if we just come before the Lord right now. Lord, I thank you for this word. Thank you because you, you allow us to hear you. Thank you because this is such a, such a direct word from you to Mavuno Church today. Today. I'm so convinced. This is your word for every single one of us who are here. Some of us are high school students. And this is why we, need, we needed to hear this message. It's not a message for the adults. It's my message. It's your message because God is challenging you right now. With that faith of yours in high school, he wants you to, to represent him, even in your young age. There's some of you, you're, 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 you've been feeling maybe even retired in the Christian faith. You served when you're younger. You had so much passion for God. You are even in ministry. And today you're living the retired Christian life. There are no retired Christians. And God is saying, hey, it's time for you to come back to understand I called you. And I'm the one who will call you home. It's not time for you to give up yet. And there's some of you, God is just convicting you in one way or the other. And you're like, Lord, I want to be a kingdom builder. I want to live 100% for you. I finally get it. And if this is you, I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet right now, wherever you are. That person who's just like, Lord, I get it. There's a place where I've been misaligned with this word. And Lord, maybe I've even experienced some of the principles, some of the curses that have worked against me because I did not understand what it was you're calling me to. But Lord, with your help, I will be a kingdom builder. Wherever you are, just stand up to your feet right now. If this is you, just stand up to your feet right now. I know there's many, many of us. The Holy Spirit is here. I know it. I sense him. I feel, I, I, I know he is here. And he's the one speaking to so many people who right now are saying, Lord, I want to surrender. I no longer want to live 80% for you. I no longer want to live 70% for you. I no longer want to look so passionate on the inside, but on the outside, but on the inside, there's many parts of me that are unsurrendered to you. Some of you may even be in ministry right now, but you know that place is true. There's still many things you're holding back. You're holding back. You're not 100%. And God is saying, today is the day. I want you to surrender 100% to me. And just begin to speak to your father right now. Say, I surrender, Lord. Whatever that issue is, he's showing it to you. Just speak to him. He's such a good God. He's such a faithful God. He's such a loving God. He is here. And he wants to speak to us. He wants to walk with us. He wants us to experience his power. He wants us to experience unlimited power in our lives. <laughs> Infinite power. Limitless power. But he wants us to come and surrender to him and allow him to be the one who leads. Father, I thank you for the surrender that is going up to you right now. I thank you for sons and daughters who are saying, now I get it, Lord. I've been half-hearted. I've been three-quarter hearted in my faith, but no more. Father, from this day, I will serve you fully, fully with the opportunities you've given me. I never want to go to heaven and have things that I didn't do. I want to do everything you put me on this earth to do. And so I surrender, Lord. And Father, I thank you for every son who's saying, forgive me, Lord, for the way I've made it about myself. But Lord, from today, I surrender 100% to running after you. And Lord, I thank you because this is a church of kingdom builders. Look at these mighty men and women who are arising. There's an army rising up in this church, Lord. There's an army of saints that are rising up, kingdom builders who will do great exploits for God because they're fully, 100% surrendered to Him. And so I bless you, Lord. I don't know, I just sense a sweet spirit of God right now just hovering over this place. And I sense that God is pleased with the prayers that He's receiving from you. I just sense that. I sense that the Father right now is saying, I'm pleased. There's nothing that pleases God more than surrender. And I just sense that heaven is rejoicing because of some of the prayers that are being prayed right now. And Lord, I just call down blessing. I call blessing down upon every servant of God in this house. I'm going to invite the rest of us to just stand up to our feet right now. I call blessing down upon every servant of God in this house. I'm assuming the ones who are sitting were seated because they're already 100% surrendered. <laughs> And so, Lord, I thank you because there's an army that is rising up in this place. And I just speak God's blessing over you. 
I speak that today you will experience the fullness of God even as we serve him together even as you live that surrendered life going forward you will hear God's voice in very clear ways that you've not even heard him before you're going to experience his guidance in clearer ways than you've experienced before as you follow him and so Lord we look forward to what you have for us the rest of this day I just thank you because your spirit is here already begin your work Lord in fact I just want to begin to declare that some of you there are things you've been praying about that already right now are being answered already right now you're going to sense answers today you're going to testify that things happen today that I've been waiting for for a long time while I was serving God while I was giving my time for God God was working on my behalf out of this room and so Lord I call your blessing down upon your people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and God's people say it together come on let's give glory to God bless you Lord amen